Hi friends, my name is Cindy and I am one of the children's librarians at Portland Public Library in Portland, Maine. Today we're going to continue our read aloud of The House with a Clock in Its Walls by John Belairs with illustrations by Edward Gorey. We're starting with chapter two. You can see the picture. Lewis woke up the next day with confused memories of the previous night running around in his head. In general, his impression was a happy one, despite the dark things that lurked in the corner, corners of the picture. He got dressed, went downstairs, and found Jonathan and Mrs. Zimmerman at breakfast. It seemed that Mrs. Zimmerman always came over to cook Jonathan's breakfast because Jonathan was such a terrible cook. Well, that was fine with Lewis. He sat down to pancakes and sausages, and before long, he was figuring out how to best use the three weeks of freedom that were left before school began. Lewis soon found out that three weeks was not nearly enough time for exploring the town of New Zebedee and the house at 100 High Street. In three weeks, he barely got started. To begin with, the town was marvelous. It was the sort of place he had always wanted to live in. Lewis's all old hometown in Wisconsin looked as if it had been built yesterday. All the houses were the same size, and the main street was just a row of bars and gas stations. New Zebedee was different. It was full of tall, elaborately decorated old houses. Even the ordinary white frame houses had things that made them seem different. A stained glass window, or a bouquet of iron flowers on top of a cupola and so many of the houses seemed to be hiding secrets. Jonathan took Lewis for some walks around the town, but more often, he just let Lewis find out things for himself. Sometimes Lewis just walked up and down Main Street and stared at the high, elaborate, false fronts of the stores. One of the stores had an abandoned opera house in its upper stories. Jonathan said that the old scenery was still up there, leaning against cases of mounds bars and five cent writing tables, tablets. At one end of Main Street was the Civil War Monument, a fantastic stone object shaped like an artist's easel. Each of the joints and corners of the easel had a soldier or a sailor standing on it, threatening the rebel army with a musket or a sword or a cannon swabber or a harpoon. The flat part of the easel was covered with the names of Capernaum County residents who had died in the Civil War. There was a small town arch near the monument, and it was called the Civil War Monument Annex because it contained the names that the carvers hadn't been able to get on the big monument. Jonathan's grandfather had fought in the war with the 5th Michigan Fire Zoab Lancers, and Jonathan was full of stories about the old man's exploits. As for the house at 100 High Street, it was every bit as wonderful as the town, besides being strange and more than a little bit scary. There were lots of rooms to explore, third best upstairs front parlors and second best back bedrooms, linen closets and playrooms and just plain rooms. Some of these were empty and full of dust, but there were others that were crammed with antique furniture. There were marble top table, tables galore and upholstered chairs on squeaky casters, and doilies pinned to the backs of the chairs, and stuffed partridges under glass bell jars. Each room had its own fireplace made of marble that looked, depending on the room, like blue cheese, or fudge ripple ice cream, or green hand soap, or milk chocolate. One afternoon, Lewis was walking down the back staircase in the south wing of the mansion when he came to a stained glass window on a landing. There were quite a few stained glass windows in the house. Lewis found them on back staircases like this one or in unused bathrooms at the, or at the ends of hallways. Sometimes he even found them set in the ceiling. He had seen this one before, or rather he had seen another window where this one was now. That was why he stopped and stared. He remembered the other window very well. It had been a big, oval window that showed a red tomato sun setting into a blue sea the color of old medicine bottles. The oval frame was still there, but in it Lewis found a window that showed a man fleeing from a forest. The forest was plum colored and the grass under the man's feet was bright green. 
The sky in the picture was a squirming, oily, brownish red. It remind, reminded Lewis of furniture polish. What had happened to the other window? Did Jonathan go around changing them at night? It was pretty strange. Another thing that was strange was the coat rack in the front hall. At first, Lewis had thought that it was just an ordinary coat rack. It stood about six feet high, and it had a little round mirror on the front. There were pegs for coats and hats, and there were little wooden compartments in the front for rubbers. It looked very ordinary, but one day, when Lewis was hanging up his raincoat, he looked at the mirror and saw a Mayan step pyramid in a steaming green jungle. He knew that the pyramid was Mayan because he had a picture of it among his Viewmaster slides. Only this scene was not fake three-dimensional the way slides were. It looked as if you could reach through the mirror and touch the vines. As Lewis watched, a brilliant red bird with a long tail flew from one tree to another. Waves of heat made the pyramid ripple. Lewis blinked and stared again. He was looking at the reflection of the rainy gray window behind him. Lewis thought a lot about the stained glass windows and the coat rack. Were they magic? He believed in magic, even though he had been taught not to. His father had spent one whole afternoon explaining to Lewis that ghosts were caused by x-rays bouncing off distant planets. But Lewis was a stubborn boy. And besides, hadn't he seen the Aladdin's lamp on the back of Jonathan's playing cards and the words Capernaum County Magicians Society? He was convinced that magic was at the bottom of this mystery. <coughs> Lewis was also convinced that he would have to solve another mystery before he could tackle the problem of the coat rack and the stained glass windows. He would have to find out why Jonathan prowled the house every night with a flashlight in his hand. Lewis had discovered that the strange incident on his first night in New Zebedee was part of a regular pattern. Every night after 12, Jonathan was out there searching. What he was searching for, Lewis could not say. Again and again, as on that first night, he had heard the floorboards creak outside his door. Again and again, he had heard Jonathan tiptoeing stealthily down the hall, entering rooms, closing doors. He heard him overhead on the third floor where Jonathan hardly ever went during the day. Then he would be back downstairs, poking around, stumbling into furniture. Maybe he was scared of burglars. Maybe so, but then why did he pound on the walls? Burglars seldom got into walls. Lewis had to find out what was going on. And so, one night, a little after 12, Lewis lowered himself silently from his bed to the cold floorboards. As stealthily as he could, he tiptoed across the room, but the warped boards complained against his feet. By the time he got to the door, he was thoroughly shaken. He wiped his hands on his robe several times and turned the knob. He took a deep breath, let it out, and stepped out into the dark hallway. Lewis clamped his hand over his mouth. He had stepped on the protruding head of a nail. It didn't really hurt much, but Lewis was scared of tetanus. When his panic had died down, he took another step. He began to edge his way down the hall. But Lewis was no better at stealthy creeping than you might think, and by the time he had bumped his head against a heavy gilt picture frame for about the third time, Jonathan called to him from one of the distant rooms. Oh, for heaven's sake, Lewis, stop playing Sherlock Holmes. You make a better Dr. Watson. Come on and join me. I'm in the bedroom with the green fireplace. Lewis was glad that his red face didn't shine in the dark. Well, at least Jonathan wasn't mad. Lewis picked his way down the hall until he found an open door. There was Jonathan, standing in the dark with a flashlight in his hand. He was playing the light over the mantel clock, a boxy black affair with gold handles on the sides, like a coffin. Evening, Lewis, or morning, as the case may be. Would you care to join me on my rounds? Jonathan's voice sounded tight and nervous. Lewis hesitated a moment, and then he plunged in. Uncle Jonathan, what are you doing? stopping the clocks. During the day, it's nice to have clocks ticking all over the house, but at night, it keeps me awake. You know how it is, Lewis, with faucets and the like. Still chattering nervously, Jonathan turned the clock around, reached into the back of it, and halted the stubby pendulum. 
Then he motioned for Lewis to follow him, and waving the flashlight a little too cheerfully, walked on to the next room. Lewis followed, but he was puzzled. Uncle Jonathan, why don't you turn the room lights on? His uncle was silent for a minute. Then he said in that same nervous voice, Oh, well, you know how it is, Lewis. If I were to go from one room to another, snapping lights on and off, what would the neighbors think? And what about the electric bill? Do you know that you get billed for an hour's worth of electricity every time you snap the lights on and off? This explanation did not sound convincing to Lewis. In the first place, Uncle Jonathan had never before given any sign that he cared what the neighbors thought about anything he did. If he wanted to sit in the glider under the chestnut tree and play a saxophone at 3 a.m., he was likely to do just that. In the second place, Jonathan had more than once left the floor lamp in his study burning all night. He was a careless man and not the sort who worried about big electric bills. It was true that Lewis had only known his uncle for three weeks, but he felt that he already had a pretty good idea of what Jonathan was like. On the other hand, he couldn't very well say, Uncle Jonathan, you're lying through your teeth. So he silently followed his uncle to the next room, the second best upstairs bathroom. It had a fireplace too, a white tile one, and there was a small white plastic clock buzzing on the mantel. Jonathan unplugged it without saying a thing and went on to the next room where he stopped a cherry wood clock with a pendulum that used three columns of mercury as a weight and then on to the next room. The last clock to be silenced was the grandfather clock in the study. Jonathan's study had a very high ceiling and all the walls were lined with books. There was a fat, slouchy brown leather easy chair that hissed when you sat down in it. And of course, there was a fireplace and there was still a fire burning in it. Over in a corner by the sliding doors that opened onto the dining room stood the tall, gloomy clock. The brass disc on the pendulum flashed dimly in the light of the dying fire. Jonathan reached inside and grabbed the long black rod. The clock stopped. Now that their strange tour was over, Jonathan lapsed into silence. He seemed to be thinking. He walked over to the fireplace, stirred up the fire, and put on another log. He threw himself down into the leather chair and waved his arm at the green easy chair on the other side of the fireplace. Have a seat, Lewis. I'd like to have a talk with you. Lewis wondered if he was going to get bawled out for sneaking up on his uncle. It didn't seem likely. Jonathan looked and sounded friendly, though his voice was still a little edgy. Lewis sat down and watched as Jonathan lit up his hookah. Lewis always liked to watch him do this. The hookah was shaped like a Spanish galleon, and the crow's nest was the mainmast of the bowl. The body of the ship was full of water for cooling the smoke, and up on the bow stood the tiny ceramic figure of a boatswain with his pipe to his lips. A long hose was plugged into the ship's stern, and there was a black rubber mouthpiece on the end. When you blew into the hose, the burning tobacco in the crow's nest sent up a long column of smoke, and the boatswain went on his little pipe. Sometimes when Jonathan made a mistake and filled the boat too full of water, the boatswain went bloop and blew bubbles. When Jonathan had the pipe going well, he drew in a big mouthful of smoke, let it out slowly and said, Lewis, I think it would be better for you to be scared than it would be for you to think of your uncle as a crabby old lunatic. I don't think you're crabby, said Lewis. Jonathan laughed, but you do think I'm off my rocker. Well, after tonight, I wouldn't blame you. John Lewis blushed. No, Uncle Jonathan, I never meant that. You know I don't think. Jonathan smiled. Yes, of course, I know. But all the same, I think it would be better if you knew something about this clock business. I can't tell you all about it because I don't know all about it. In fact, there are times when I think I don't know much about it at all. But I'll tell you what I know. He crossed his legs, sat back, and puffed some more at his pipe. Lewis sat forward in the big green chair. He kept clasping and unclasping his hands, and he stared hard at Jonathan. After a brief dramatic pause and a particularly long drag at the galleon hookah, Jonathan began. I haven't lived in this house always, Lewis. In fact, I only moved here five years ago. I used to live down on Spruce Street near the waterworks. But when the old owner died and the place was put up for sale cheap and it meant a chance to live next door to my best friend, Mrs. Zimmerman. Who was the old owner? Asked Lewis, interrupting. I was going to get to that. 
His name was Isaac Izzard, initials I-I, like a Roman numeral two. You'll find his double I carved or stamped or painted all on all sorts of things all over this house. The wainscoting, the floorboards, the insides of cupboards, the fuse box, the mantelpieces, everywhere. You'll even find a Roman numeral two worked into the tracery on the wallpaper in the upstairs front hallway. Jonathan paused for a second and looked thoughtful. Have to get that paper replaced someday. Oh well, back to what I was saying. Old Isaac Izzard. His name is odd, isn't it? Mrs. Zimmer Zimmerman thinks that it comes from Izzard, which in some parts of England is the word for Z, which is the word the English use to identify the letter Z. I go along with Mrs. Zimmerman's theory because I can't think of a better one, and besides, she is a Z lady, so she should know. But as I was saying, and I will get around to saying something sometime, Lewis, he puffed on his pipe some more and wriggled around in his chair to get comfortable. As I was saying, old Isaac was a warlock. What's that? Uncle Jonathan looked very serious. It's the word for a male witch. Lewis shuddered. Then, out of nowhere, a strange thought came to him. Are you one too? He asked in a tiny, frightened voice. Jonathan looked at him with a strange smile. Would it scare you if I said I was? No, I like you an awful lot, and you can be a warlock if you want to be one, I guess. You wouldn't be a bad one, I know. That depends on how you mean bad, said Jonathan, chuckling. If you mean that I wouldn't be an evil one, you're right. If you mean that I wouldn't be too bad at wizarding, well, I don't know. I'm pretty much of a parlor magician, though I have a few tricks that go beyond rabbits and playing cards, like stained glass windows and coat racks, said Lewis, grinning. Yes, exactly like those. And just to make you perfectly secure, let me inform you that Mrs. Zimmerman is also a wizard, though in her case, the term should be witch. Couldn't you find a better name? Asked Lewis timidly. Well, she prefers maga or enchantrix, but I can't use such words without breaking up. So she's old witch Florence to me. She's really a much more serious wizard than I am. Got her D Mag A, that's Dr. Magicorum Artium, from the University of Göttingen in Germany in 1922. I just have an AB from Michigan Agricultural College. What in? asked Lewis, as if he were interviewing Jonathan for a job. Actually, he was interested in Jonathan's college work. Both of Lewis's parents had gone to college and they always talked a lot about their college work. What in? said Jonathan, blushing. What in? Why, agricultural science, animal husbandry and all that. I was going to be a farmer till my grandpa died and left me a pile of money. But back to old Isaac Izzard. You're still interested, aren't you? Oh yes, of course, please tell me, I want to know. Isaac, as I say, was a wizard. He fooled around with black magic, the worst kind of thing a wizard can do. I can't tell you about anything bad that I absolutely know he did for sure. But if one wizard can judge another, I'd say he was an evil one. A very evil one. Mrs. Zimmerman thinks so too. She lived next door to him for years, remember. You'll have to ask her about him yourself, of course, but there were many evenings when she and I would stand in her backyard and look up to see old Isaac's evil face in the window of the cupola on top of the house. He'd be holding an oil lamp and just staring out at the night. Mrs. Zimmerman claims that he would sit for hours in the cupola during the day. He seemed to be taking notes. Gee, that is weird. What was he taking notes for? Lord only knows, Lewis, but I'm sure it wasn't anything good. At any rate, to get on with my story, it must be getting pretty late by now, but without the clocks, I have no idea what time it is. Where was I? Oh, yes, old Isaac died during a wild thunderstorm, one of the worst in the history of Capernaum County. You can look it up in the New Zebedee Chronicle if you want to. Roofs blown off barns, trees uprooted, and a bolt of lightning melted the iron doors on the tomb Isaac is buried in now. I'll have to show you that tomb someday. Ugly old dump, one of those little stone houses for the respectable dead. There are several of them up in our cemetery, some of them really fancy. This one was built by Isaac's family in the 1850s, but it was never used till they put his wife in there. She died before he did. What was she like? Pretty strange, as you'd have to be to choose Isaac Izzard for a husband. I don't remember anything about her but her eyeglasses. Lewis stared. Her eyeglasses? 
Yes, I passed her once on the street and she turned and looked at me. It might have been the way the sun caught her spectacles, but I remember two freezing circles of gray light burning into me. I turned away and closed my eyes, but those two cold spots stayed there. I had nightmares for a week after that. How did she die? Lewis imagined Mrs. Izzard falling from a cliff during a hurricane or flinging herself from the cupola of the house. How? Quietly and mysteriously. No funeral. Some strange looking people from out of town came and helped Isaac bury her. After that, he went into seclusion. Further seclusion, that is. He and she had always been hermits, but after her death, he really shut himself up. Built a high, big board fence between this house and Mrs. Zimmerman's. I had it torn down as soon as I moved in. He smiled contentedly. Lewis felt that his Uncle Jonathan was happy living at 100 High Street, despite the fact that old Isaac Izzard had made the place his castle. Is that all there is to the story? asked Lewis cautiously. Oh my, no, we're just getting to the good part. Look, here I am selfishly puffing away at this boat and you have nothing. Let's go out to the kitchen and get a couple of glasses of milk and some chocolate chip cookies, okay? Sure, said Lewis, who liked chocolate chip cookies even more than he liked Welch's fudge bars. In a few minutes, they were back in the study, sitting by the quietly crackling fire and munching cookies. Suddenly, a book fell out of the bookcase. Flop. Two more fell out. Flop, flop. Lewis stared at the black gap in the row of books. A long, withered, bony hand appeared. It seemed to be groping for something. Lewis sat rigid with terror, but Jonathan merely smiled. A little to your left, my dear. That's it. Now you've got it. A latch clicked and a large section of the built-in bookcase swung outward. More books fell to the floor and there stood Mrs. Zimmerman with a strand of cobweb hanging from her left eyeglass. Her sleeve was covered with whitish dust. Fine way to build a secret panel, she grumbled, with the latch on the room side instead of on the passage side. It adds to the mystery doll face. As you might have guessed, Lewis, this house has a secret passageway. You enter it through the china cupboard in the kitchen. Come on in, Florence. I was just going to tell Lewis about the clock in the walls. Mrs. Zimmerman gave him a look as if to say, do you think that's a wise thing to do? But she shrugged and help her, helped herself to the cookies and milk. <clears throat> good cookies, she said, munching, very good. She always says that because she makes them, explained Jonathan, helping himself to two more. And now that everyone's mouth is stuffed, including mine, I guess I'll go on. Where were we? Oh, yes, well, I had no sooner moved in here than I felt that something was wrong. The house had a kind of listening stillness, and then I heard it. Heard what? This was Lewis, who had worked himself to the edge of his chair. He had even stopped eating his cookie. The clock. You know how you can be in a room with a clock ticking and you won't notice it for a long time? Then, when things are very, very quiet and you aren't thinking about anything in particular, there it is! Lewis jumped up and looked around wildly. Where? Jonathan laughed. No, 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 I didn't mean to frighten you like that. I mean, I heard it for the first time in this room. It was ticking away in the walls. You can go over to that wall and listen for it if you like. Lewis got up and walked over to the book-lined wall. He put his ear to a row of black leather volumes and listened. His eyes opened wide. It is there, Uncle Jonathan, it is! He was excited by the discovery, but then his face changed. He looked afraid. What is it for, Uncle Jonathan? What does it do? I haven't the faintest idea, said Jonathan, though I know that I want to blot it out. That's why I have all those stupid clocks. I didn't used to be so fond of incessant ticking and sudden loud hell raising every hour on the hour, but I prefer my clocks to his. Jonathan's face had turned grim. He shook his head, smiled a little half-hearted smile, and went on. You may be wondering why I don't just tear down the wall and rip out the clock. Well, it wouldn't do any good. It sounds like it's behind every wall, up in the attic, down in the cellar, in the closets and storerooms and parlors, and sometimes it seems to be slowing down. I keep hoping it will stop, but then it picks up and keeps going. I don't know what to do. There was a note of real despair in his voice. For a minute, Lewis thought his uncle would cry. Then Mrs. Zimmerman broke in. 
I'll tell you one thing you ought not to do, Jonathan Barnevelt. You oughtn't to frighten Lewis with something you don't know anything about. <clears throat> After all, the ticking may be some leftover magic from the old Coots experiments, or Death Watch beetles, or an illusion of some kind, like in houses that have whispering galleries. I get a funny kind of hum in my head now and then. It goes doo for a while, and then it goes away. Jonathan looked irritated. Oh, Florence, there's no need to kid around. You don't think it's something harmless, and neither do I. I wouldn't have told Lewis just to frighten him, but I thought it would be better for him to know about the clock than to think that his uncle was getting ready for the loony bin. You see, he caught me making my nightly rounds. Well, said Mrs. Zimmerman, I don't know about the loony bin, but Uncle Jonathan had better be getting ready for Betty by if he's going to take us on a picnic tomorrow. She reached into the folds of her dress and pulled out a silver watch on a long chain. She popped the lid open and announced that it was 3 a.m. Jonathan looked up with surprise. It is? Good grief, I had no idea. Please, Uncle Jonathan, said Lewis, interrupting. Can you tell me one thing more? Sure, Lewis, what is it? Lewis looked fidgety and embarrassed. Well, if the clocks are supposed to drown out the noise of the clock in the walls, why do you stop them at night? Jonathan sighed. I don't stop them every night. Some nights I just walk around checking all the rooms. It makes me feel secure somehow. I can't explain it, but some nights, like this one, I get the urge to stop all the blasted everlasting ticking. I get the feeling that if I were to make the house quiet, perfectly quiet, then maybe I could hear the real clock the magic one, ticking behind one particular wall or in some cubby hole, but it never works and I always feel half crazy for trying. Lewis still looked puzzled. If it's a magic clock, he said slowly, then wouldn't it be invisible? I mean, wouldn't it be something you couldn't actually put your hands on? Jonathan shook his head. Not really, Lewis. Most magic is accomplished with solid everyday objects, objects that have had spells set over them. One which I knew tried to obliterate her enemy by leaving a photo of him under the running water of her gutter spout. Her reasoning was that he would die when the face on the picture was wiped out. It's a common method. No, Lewis, this is a clock as real as Grandpa over there, only it's enchanted. But what it is enchanted to do, I don't for the life of me know. Well, I know something weird, Beard, said Mrs. Zimmerman, dangling her watch like a pendulum before Jonathan's eyes. I know that if we don't catch just a little teeny bit of shut-eye, we're all going to be wearing our crabby caps in the morning. Lewis, off to bed. Jonathan, same with you. I'll rinse the cookie plates and put away the milk. Later, up in his room, Lewis stood in the middle of the floor, staring at a patch of flowered wallpaper near the fireplace. He walked quickly over to the wall and put his ear to it. Yes, the ticking was here too. He walked across the room and listened to another wall, more of the same. Lewis walked back to the center of the room and then abruptly he began to pace. He paced in quick strides with his hands behind his back, the way he had seen his father do when he was upset. He paced and tried to think logically, but logic wasn't much help where the clock in the walls was concerned. So at last, Lewis gave it up. He jumped into bed and went to sleep. And that was part two of The House with the Clock in Its Walls. I hope you're enjoying it as much as I am. My name is Cindy, and I am one of the children's librarians at Portland Public Library in Portland, Maine. I hope to see you for part three soon. Bye-bye, friends.